Hi, everyone. Welcome to Radiant Living, Inspiring Humanity to Thrive. Today, I am so privileged that I have Edie Weinstein here with us. Um, what do you say about Edie Weinstein? She's done it all, and especially in the healing field, um, the healing arts. She's a reverend. She's a licensed social worker. Uh, she has a full practice. She's an author. She's inspirational speaker. Uh, she has done uh, large gatherings. Uh, she has written numerous books. She's uh, been involved in other books um, as uh, part of a group. Uh, she has been the founder, creator of, and I want to say this correctly, it's the Hug, Hug Mobsters. Arm. Hug, Hug mobsters, mobsters armed. armed with love. Yes, and it's worldwide. Yeah. Um, you, uh, she has um, been a bliss coach. Uh, she has interviewed numerous people in the healing arts. Uh, I believe the uh, His Holiness, the Dalai Lama, mm -hmm. Deepak Chopra, um, Jack Canfield. I I could go on and on. It's a, it's Marianne an incredible Williamson, list. Rob yes. Das. Ben yes. and Jerry, yeah, they were fun. The ice cream guys. Yes. <laughs> yes, I mean the list goes on and on. It's incredible. I I say we need uh, to have Edie Weinstein more than a month on to talk about oh, her life in you. the healing field. And I want to open it up to you because there's so much um, mm -hmm. that you have, in fact, done and that you continue to do every day. Mm -hmm. And I, I'd like you to tell us a little bit about what's going on right now. Sure. Well, whenever I'm I'm interviewed and I hear my bio, I think, when does that woman sleep? <laughs> so I have to tell you that I used to think of that sleep was highly overrated. And that was until June 12th of 2014, when I had a heart attack at 55. Oh, wow. um, I didn't take naps. I was working 12 to 14 hour days, sleeping maybe five or six hours a night, swigging five hour energy drinks occasionally. Um, I was a, a workaholic. And um, I've learned since then that naps are my friend. That I, you know, that I, that I look forward to them. In fact, this weekend, this past weekend was Memorial Day weekend and I had three days off. I indulged in naps. So in order to stay as busy as I am, I've got to replenish and everybody else does too. You know, we like to think that we have, if we have a passion or purpose for something, we've got to be on all the time. Mm -hmm. You can't be like an engine, you burn out. So the heart attack, we're coming up on my ninth cardioversary. And the heart attack was a wake up call. And I, you know, my background and training um, is in social work. I have an, an MSW, which stands for master of social work, mm -hmm. but I think of it sometimes as master of saving the world. And mm -hmm. that's, there's a peril to that. There's, you know, that's, that's not very healthy for the one doing the work. So I imagine that your audience are people that are either in the healing fields or have experienced physical, psychological, spiritual healing, mm -hmm. you got to let yourself coast in between. Like when you're riding a bicycle, can't be pedaling all the time. Yes. You got to coast occasionally. So mm -hmm. that's my background is um, I'm a licensed social worker, MSW, LSW, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, I'm at the end of a work day. So my voice is a little scratchy. Um, I'm also, as you mentioned, an interfaith minister. Yes. Uh, I was ordained through the new seminary, which is an interfaith school in New York. Mm -hmm. 1999. <clears throat> so that's part of what I do. I'm a Reiki master. Um, I don't have an actual Reiki practice. I do what I call bliss coaching mm -hmm. to help people live their bliss. Um, the, my first book was called, <clears throat> excuse me, um, the bliss mistress guide to yes. transforming the ordinary into the extraordinary. Mm -hmm. And they're chicken soup for the soul kind of stories. Mm -hmm. So I encourage people every day to live their bliss you know, and think about what would that be for you? So what it, Marissa, what is your bliss? Um, my bliss, I have to say, uh, <laughs> rest and relaxation. Cause I'm also a workaholic and, mm -hmm. um, I really very rarely sleep a few hours a night. So if I can actually, I know if I can actually have a time where I could just kick up my feet and relax for a few minutes, that is bliss for me. So there's okay. always something. Hmm? Okay. Say so you, I, I tell people that, you know, what your bliss is when it gives you the tingles, when it's, mm -hmm. um, um, lights, lights you up like a human sparkler, 
when you say, okay, maybe it's not necessarily what I was born to do, but it feels pretty darn good when I do it. And <clears throat> excuse me, my intention is that what I do be of service, that be of benefit to the world. Um, before the call, we were talking about the state of the world mm-hmm. and it's scary. It's overwhelming. Um, I grew up, I'm 64. So I grew up during the Vietnam war, the assassinations of JFK, mm-hmm. MLK and RFK um, civil rights movement. It was a pretty intense time in our, in our world. Mm -hmm. It feels like it's on steroids right now. Yes. So any opportunity that any of us has to be kind, to do good in the world, to be of service, Mm -hmm. to counteract, to light the candle and counteract the darkness, do it. It does. You don't have to be a professional. You do it by smiling at Mm -hmm. people. You do it by opening a door for somebody, you know, you pay it forward. So that's part of my passion is um, encouraging people to be fully themselves for themselves, but also in service to the, to the world. And Um, so this, the, the, the hug monsters, this is like incredible. I mean, it's just, it's so wonderful to think. And I know that it was also sometimes not uh, planned. It actually can be spontaneous. spontaneous. Right. So what Hug Mobsters Armed with Love is, give you the background, <clears throat> excuse me, Valentine's Day weekend of 2014, um, the day after Valentine's Day, the 15th, I brought a group of friends to 30th Street Station, which is a big train station in Philadelphia, near mm-hmm. where I live, for a free hugs flash mob. And oh. at 12 o'clock, we unleashed ourselves on the station and we went around, and there were a dozen of us, asking people if they would like a hug. We didn't tr- grab people. Um, one of our friends who's a musician walked around singing the song, give a little bit, you know, the super mm-hmm. tramp song. Yeah. Um, so we, he did that. And we estimate that within the hour's time, we hugged about 200 people. And these are people that had no clue that these crazy people were going to be there. Mm. And I chose that particular day for two reasons. One is that I wanted people to understand that, Valentine's Day isn't just one day out of the year. It could be every day. And it's also not just for romantic partners. Love is for everybody. Mm-hmm. So one of the people that showed up there um, and approached us told us that he was an Iraq war vet and he was the only survivor of his platoon and he had survivor's guilt. And he thought about ending his life. He said, until I met you people, because you give me hope. Mm-hmm. And of course, tears streaming oh, down. One, yeah. And he said, can I join you? So naturally we gave him a sign, free hug sign, excuse me. And he he walked around hugging people. And I wish all these years later, I knew how to find him because I would love to see if he has found his purpose, if he's living his bliss, if he's still going around hugging people, Um, I may never see him again. So that tells me that we never know the impact that we will have on another human being. Mm -hmm. That's true. Just seeing him, it's more than just a story I tell. It's he lives in here. Mm-hmm. Um, so friends started calling us hug mobsters, you know, hug mob, flash mob. Yes. And I said, ooh, mobsters, guns, mafia. Mm-hmm. I don't think so. <laughs> um, so I added the tagline armed with love. And I I mentioned the uh, the heart attack. Mm-hmm. That happened, I think, five or six months, five months, five months afterward. And as part of my cardiac rehab. I walked through Doylestown, Pennsylvania, which is my little town. And I said, why don't I combine the hugging with the walking? Because hugs feel good. They're yes. cardiac friendly. They're also emotionally heart friendly. Mm-hmm. So I organized free hug strolls and I invited friends to come along. And some of them did. And sometimes I just did them by myself. I carry my free hug signs in my car. And um, sometimes I'll just break them out and you know, so I've done probably since 2014, I think I've, I've hugged several thousand people and they've been all over the country in Canada. And then in 2018, I hugged my way across Ireland. Um, That was my my present to myself for my 60th birthday was to go to Ireland. And um, it was just an incredible experience. Then along came the pandemic and it Mm -hmm. shut everything down. And I literally fell into a panic. I thought, what if we can never hug again? You know, humans are hardwired for touch. Yes. It's part of our makeup. Um, we have skin hunger. That's mm-hmm. just as important to me as food hunger. And then I thought, okay, 
how could a loving God or whatever, whatever you believe in Mm -hmm. create people who need touch to survive only to pull it away from us. Mm -hmm. And I said, Nope, this is, it can't possibly be. So shortly into the pandemic, I had a dream and I have very vivid dreams. And in it, I dreamed that we could hug back to back or back to front, like spooning. And in, in my dreams early on in the pandemic, everybody was wearing a mask. Yes. So it was pretty, it was pretty, you know, on target with what was going on. So that assured me that we would eventually be able to hug. And um, I live by myself. So there was no other human being around to hug mm. but me. And I, you know, I venture guess that a lot of your listeners live alone and yes. they had to deal with the pandemic by themselves. Mm-hmm. Um, so I hugged trees. Um, I hugged stuffed animals, um, pillows, blankets. Mm-hmm. I kind of wrap myself up in blankets. And I'm grateful for the modern technology that allows us to be able to at least make eye contact with people, yes. even if we couldn't touch them. Um, at the time, my, my grandson had been born that January. And I say that he was the best thing that happened to our family in 2020. So in the beginning of you know, the first few months on the planet, I was there almost every day to help. And then that stopped in mid March. Mm-hmm. So I didn't see them in person for 11 weeks. Wow. And it was so, that was probably the hardest 11 weeks of my life was to be away from my, my son and daughter-in-law, my grandson. Okay. So um, we would do FaceTime. I would make videos for him. And then probably around mother's day, I, I went back mm-hmm. over there. And I still couldn't hold them, but at least I could visit. And then gradually we worked our way back toward full physical contact. And I now have, he's now three. I think he turned three in January and I have a one-year-old granddaughter and they are, they are my joys. They're how I spend my, my weekday mornings as I watch them for a few hours and then come home and do my therapy work. And then the other grandparents and aunt take the next shift. Mm -hmm. So I encourage people, if you're still alone, Mm -hmm. if you're still not in physical contact with people, find ways to nurture yourself. And if you are back out in the world and you're not comfortable hugging, you can do virtual hugs like this, where you wrap your arms around yourself. So hug mobsters, you know, it feels like it's my branding that people say, oh, you're Mm -hmm. the hug lady. (laughs) And I didn't create that free hugs movement. Um, It was created by a a gentleman named Juan Mann. Um, and it's a pseudonym, one Mm man, I forget what his actual name is, but he was in Australia and he had just moved there and was really lonely. So he went into a town square, made up a free hug sign. He might even have blindfolded himself Mm -hmm. the first time and held out his arms. 20 minutes went by before someone, before anybody. Yes. Yeah. And it was an older woman who's, I think her dog had just died. She was very sad. Mm -hmm. So he was tall. She was short and they met in the Mm -hmm. middle. And then once other people saw this, you know, act of affection, they joined in. Mm -hmm. So it became a movement and there are people all over the world doing free hugs. Um, There's another aspect to it that I enjoy. It's called free mom hugs. Have you ever heard of that? No. Um, Sarah Cunningham is a mom in Oklahoma city Mm -hmm. and her son came out to her as a gay man, um, maybe 2014 and they had the dates wrong, but, um, she was a devout Christian who struggled Mm -hmm. with the idea of accepting her son. And she said, how are you making me choose between you and my son? And then she realized she didn't have to, Mm -hmm. he invited her to go to a pride festival in town And she made up a button that said free mom hugs. And her idea was that if your mom isn't willing to hug you, Mm -hmm. you come out, I'll be your mom. He also left her, she left her non-affirming church, became a minister herself, and she married same-sex couples. And then she's also a stand-in mom. Oh, wonderful. She says, if your mom won't be there, I'll be there and I'll bring the bubbles. Mm-hmm. Um, what's really cool, and it hasn't happened yet, but Jamie Lee Curtis got a hold of her story and they're making a film about Sarah. And oh, lovely. They, look, they look a lot alike. So I'm waiting for that to come out. That's very cool. So oh, I do wonderful. free mom hugs. And then there are also free dad hugs. So um, I go to Pride Fest and oh, I have yes. people there. Oh, there's several wonderful. coming up in my area. So 
you know, hugs are healing. Hugs yes. Help, oh, absolutely. Help people accept who they are yes. and to know that they're accepted by other people. Mm-hmm. So that's one of my joys. Um, I did my first TED talk, TEDx talk. Yes. I was going to mention that. Yeah. That's wonderful. Yeah. And the subject, that was fun. the yeah. subject, Over, overcoming the taboo of touch. And isn't um, that amazing? <laughs> that and I did talk a lot about, yeah, I did talk a lot about hug mobsters, but it is taboo. We're taught, um, you're not, you know, don't, you know, don't hug anybody. They'll be uncomfortable with it. There are a lot of people for whom touch was either limited growing up, limited, mm-hmm. sexual, abusive, coercive, mm-hmm. or just not there. Um, as a therapist, I talked to clients who didn't have an affectionate upbringing. Mm-hmm. And I feel very sad. Um, some of them have learned to be affectionate and some of them are hands off. Um, mm-hmm. And consent is huge. Um, you know, the Me Too, the hashtag Me Too movement. Yes. All about consent. I don't touch anybody when I'm doing Mm -hmm. free hugs without their permission. Mm -hmm. And even in our family um, with the little, the littles, you know, my, my tiny humans, um, we always say, would you like a hug? Mm -hmm. And my grandson loves to tease because he'll say no hugs, no hugs. And then he'll charge (laughs) up and hug me. Um, And he knows that he has the power to say no hugs and I don't get offended. Um, I'll say, how about a wave or a high five or blow kisses. Mm -hmm. So Children need to know they have a choice yes. because when, when I were growing up, we were told, oh, go hug so-and-so. Their the feelings will be hurt if you don't hug them. Mm-hmm. Uh-uh. Right. I, you know, they are not required to hug us. Right. Um, and even, even my son and daughter-in-law will, will say that to him. Mm. Um, you know, would you like a hug before I go to work? And, you know, I think it's going to help them both have a sense mm-hmm. of body autonomy. I mean, I, I personally struggle with that. I mean, I came from a wonderfully warm family um, that showed affection always. But being a therapist, I'm always fearful. Uh, maybe the time frame that I was studying, what was told to us, I'm always fearful to cross the line. I won't right. even show emotion for them. I would. I want to be strong for them, but I can't imagine attempting to break down with them. Mm-hmm. I always mm-hmm. hold back. Um, and I think that that's my, my issue. I don't know how I would deal one-on-one with someone. Uh, I, and it is a struggle because there are times where, uh, of course I'm a human being, it affects me, but I really try not to, because I always want to give that professional aspect. Well, prof- yeah. Well, professional doesn't have to mean distant. Mm-hmm. Um, I found, and I've been a therapist in one form or another for 40 years. And what I found is. Um, you don't have to be, you want to model being human. Mm-hmm. My clients know they can tell me anything. They know that if they want to hug and we're doing in-person sessions, I will hug them. Mm-hmm. Um, if they are struggling with something, because I've dealt with clients that have experienced trauma mm-hmm. and some of the touch, some of the trauma is around touch. I won't touch them. Right. I won't shake their hand unless they're comfortable with it. And during the pandemic, my sessions were telehealth. Yes, telehealth. me too. Me too. Um, but now we're back in the office mm-hmm. together. I still, I still do some telehealth, but mm-hmm. um, we can have people back in the office. Mm-hmm. And when I meet someone for the first time, I'll ask them if they're comfortable shaking hands. And they are. And we have plenty of hand sanitizer mm-hmm. in the office. Mm-hmm. Um, and if, you know, if someone needs a hug and they ask for it, absolutely. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Now, this is just a little aside. Did you find that a lot of your clients were fearful going back? Some. I mean, we eased our way back. We wore masks up until mm-hmm. about a month ago. Yes. And it's still optional. If they, you know, I work mm-hmm. in a medical building. Mm-hmm. So we are, our company is owned by a hospital. So we had to adhere to their protocol. Mm-hmm. Yes. Um, so it's, you know, there was a certain sense of safety behind the mask. But, uh, you know, I'm, I'm vaxxed, I'm boosted, mm-hmm. I'm as protected as I can be, that's what mm-hmm. you know. And I like not wearing masks because I get to see their full expression. Yes, yes. You know? And um, there's a connection. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm imagining you feel the same way. I'm honored that mm-hmm. they let me in the inner sanctum. Yes. I mean, I have clients that say, um, you know, they hear my voice in their head. 
when they're judging themselves, they'll mm-hmm. say, what would Edie tell me? Mm-hmm. How would she want me to deal with this? Mm-hmm. As a therapist, we're accountability partners. You know, we can't make our clients do anything. No. But if they make a commitment to themselves, I'll hold them to it. Mm-hmm. Yes, you know, exactly. Um, we're mirrors. Mm-hmm. You know, we mirror back to them what they're saying or doing. Mm-hmm. Um, I tell my clients, if you don't believe in yourself, borrow my, borrow my belief in you. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, it's, you know, we're all human. We all have, excuse me a minute. You know, we have our own challenges and, you know, I I think that's an essential part of, of being a therapist. Mm -hmm. No, I will say that I found a lot of my clients were way I'm in New York. We're about an hour and a half outside of New York city. Many people, raced up here in fear um, because it it was very congested in New York City and um, very claustrophobic for them in small um, environments. So they ran out of the cities. And I think that a lot of the clients were very fearful to go back one-on-one. I still have many telehealth people and um, trying to get them back into the world, um, but they're still fearful, I think. And yeah. we, and still we're, we're the same, you know, you can wear a mask if you want. And I always wear one. If they wear one, I wear one just right. as a courtesy yeah, in too. the room. Yeah. Yes. So, but I think it's going to be a long road for many. Yep. Yep. And I, and um, at first, you know, when we were, we were told we needed to do telehealth, I thought, how are we going to connect heart to heart with our clients mm-hmm. if we're looking at them in a little box? But I, I have to tell you, it's, um, it's only slightly less intimate than it is in the room with them. Mm-hmm. You know, that there's a connection that, you know, I thought, how are we going to feel? But they tell me that they, in some some cases, prefer to be home because mm-hmm. it's their safe zone. I like doing telehealth because I'm barefoot. I get to be yeah. barefoot. <laughs> you know? But it is true that a lot of them, that's their protective barrier. Right. And they're comfortable right. there. And so they're happier to stay in their, their own environment. Right. Yeah. The other cool thing about it has changed. It has. has Right. Yep. Um, You know, I, I've written it. I'm also a journalist and I write for various websites, publications, and I've written a lot about, you know, returning back. We can't go back. No, I mean, the world has changed so dramatically. Nothing is ever going to be the same, but I'm hoping that for some people, it's been a valuable lesson in how precious mm-hmm. life is and how valuable our relationships yes. are and not to take that for granted. Um, you know, and, and, you know, I've had couples tell me and some of them, some, my friends, some of them clients mm-hmm. saying that they can't imagine anybody better to quarantine with, with than a partner. And that's like, Oh, some relationships work. Yes. I've had, I've had clients that were planning on splitting until the pandemic and then mm-hmm. they couldn't you know um so some of them you know reconnected mm-hmm. because they were stuck in the same yes. environment um so it is it is challenging and i work with a lot of i work with people in my therapy practice from five years up to senior adults mm-hmm. and the kids some of the kids love being back in school some of the kids felt more comfortable being you know doing school online Mm -hmm. Um, so it's an adjustment for them. Yes. It absolutely, it absolutely is an adjustment for the kids. And I grew up in the 1960s and seventies and I think kids have it so much tougher now. Mm -hmm. There, you know, there's so much more pressure than we had. There wasn't the internet. There wasn't cyber bullying. There weren't these, you know, these crazy TikTok challenges. Um, you know, it just so much harder. So oh, I oh, com- and com- oh, completely different, completely yeah. different yeah. times and, yeah. and so much more out there. And the technology, of course, um, it brings the world to your fingertips. But again, it brings the world to your fingertips. So, right. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm, you know, I work with a lot of people who are resilient thrivers and I'm, I'm honored to work with with them, too. Um, now, I'm not because I'm licensed in Pennsylvania. I don't see therapy clients outside of Pennsylvania, but I do coaching and I differentiate between coaching and therapy work. Coaching is goal oriented, mm-hmm. working on on a particular 
project. And my role as a coach is to help people get from where they are to where they want to be. Yeah. So um, I don't actually do psychotherapy when Mm -hmm. I work with coaching clients. So most of the people that come to me for that um, want to write a book or want to create their own coaching practice or Mm -hmm. want to create um, a website or something Mm -hmm. that they're not doing or want to have healthier relationships Mm -hmm. or make more money or whatever Mm -hmm. it is. So we work on that particular goal. And that's a, that's a joy too, you know, seeing people transform. Mm -hmm. Yes. I do the same thing, although I have reciprocity in some States, but I, um, but I also do coaching and it's the same thing. It's project based for what they're looking for at the time. Um, but of course the psychotherapy, I do use alternative methods. I think you do as well because in your work, I mean, I know maybe yeah. not in the, in the therapy practice, mm-hmm. um, but you also use alternative methods, correct? Yeah. Well, when I work with therapy clients, um, we do journaling. We, I have mm-hmm. them create vision boards, yes. um, same as I would in coaching. Um, I encourage them to listen to certain types of music, listen to certain podcasts, watch Ted talks, um, you know, something that inspires them because there's so much out there that's valuable yes. that inspires people to, to, I don't even know how to expand their horizons mm-hmm. to do something different than what they were used to doing. Yes. Yeah. I mean, it's and, absolutely true. And people feel so good when they accomplish something, mm-hmm. you know, if it, um, I went back to the gym about a month and a half ago, I was, I belonged to, do they have Planet Fitness in your area? Yes, we do. Okay. So I was going to Planet Fitness for many, many years, like even, before, I think even before the heart attack. And what I like about Planet Fitness is that it's the judgment free zone. And there are people there of all body sizes and shapes, all ages, all conditions. I've seen, there's mm-hmm. one guy that comes there using crutches mm-hmm. and he still works out. And there are people that are 20 years older than me. And there are teenagers that work mm-hmm. out there. So I had been going pretty consistently until the pandemic. And then I stopped and I said, all right, um, I need to go back because I know when I, when I work out, I feel stronger. I feel um, more relaxed afterward and I feel more accomplished. So I'm there about three or four times a week. Now my kid, my grandkids give me a workout anyway. So <laughs> them and picking them up and all you know, well, that's what you're right um, but that's what you're actually doing staying in shape for them for them right <laughs> right because i you know i want to be around for them for as long as mm-hmm. i can be and i don't want to be a um fetchy old lady do you know yes. the, the word fetch okay yes yes um yeah so um they they help keep me young yeah oh, of course like afterwards you know yeah yeah, yeah. No. so i'm i'm grateful that i have that Yes. you know, that connection. And I say that my friends are my treasures. So it's feeling good to get back out into the world mm-hmm. in person with them too. Um, oh, so, of course. Yeah. So, the, and, you know, the world, go, go ahead. I'm sorry. Oh, no, I wanted to ask you because um, I know that you do something called laugh yoga. Laughter yoga. Mm-hmm. Laughter yoga, yeah. right. But it is yeah. actually yoga as well. No, it's not no? yoga on the mat at all. Nope, nope, nope. No. Laughter yoga was created Ooh, I'm embarrassed to say I don't know the exact dates, but 20, 30 years ago um, by a cardiologist in India. His name mm. is Dr. Madan, M-A-D-A-N, Kataria, K-A-T-A-R-I-A. He's a cardiologist. Mm. And he and his wife, who is a yoga teacher, um, um, ah, middle-aged moment, I can't remember mm. her name, but um, she, they, he used to go to a park in Mumbai and he get mm-hmm. together with friends and they tell jokes and they, and they laugh. Mm-hmm. And then they ran out of jokes. And he thought, what if the healing power of laughter isn't about humor or jokes? What if it's just the act right. of laughing that does the body and mind just as good mm-hmm. as, you know, as can't is mm-hmm. laughter at something that we call humor because humor, I mean, what might be funny to you may not be to me and vice versa. Right. So he, his wife said, do you realize that the same muscles that we use for laughter are the same muscles that we use when we do yogic breathing? Oh, and wow, yes. So the way laughter yoga works is that the idea is to be 
childlike and playful mm -hmm. because kids laugh a gazillion times a day yes. and adults for no reason at all. That's um, true. Yeah. They don't have to have a reason to laugh, but adults feel like they do. So laughter yoga is playful. It's joyful. Um, it's considered light aerobic exercise mm -hmm. and you can do it by yourself, but it's even more fun with a group of people. So May, the first weekend in May was World Laughter Day. So it was the first gathering in, you know, in Philadelphia mm -hmm. since the pandemic that we all got to, you know, our mm -hmm. laughter yoga community got together. So with laughter yoga, you just laugh. So it just goes like this. <laughs> oh, you start laughing. <laughs> <laughs> come on yeah. and and you just laugh and, yeah and it's Wait, true I'm though. Not I mean, any laughter over there yeah i know but i yeah you when you laugh i mean but honestly <laughs> you are using you join me you just oh, everybody just laughs they just laugh <laughs> right you just laugh you just laugh <laughs> and you are then using your diaphragm step. yeah yep yep so the next step is what they call the 40 core c-o-r-e exercises so they're improv exercises where you do them and you laugh so my favorite is mental floss. Most of us have a lot of judgments and gunk stuck in our brains. Mm -hmm. So mental floss is where you take like dental floss. You take yes. this big roll and you pull out the floss <laughs> mm -hmm. and then you stick it in your ear. Can you join me? Stick yes, the metal floss right in your ear. <laughs> yeah. And you're pulling and you pull out the other out. way. Yeah. And well, yes. <laughs> and, and think about you're it. Laughing. You're cleaning out. And, and then you're, you're shaking. And, you're and then you shake it out. And you make sure you don't shake it on anybody. Yeah. So that's one of them. Um, one of the, another one is um, looking in the mirror and laughing. Another one is lottery winning. Like you win the lottery ticket. <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> and then you realize <sighs> you got one number off. <laughs> like that. So look up laughter yoga. Oh, um, yes. I'm definitely going to have to look up laughteryoga.org laughter yes. so it's all over the world on every continent probably in every country thousands and thousands of people are doing laughter yoga so there are amazing videos on youtube that you can you can laugh along with as well oh definitely so, i know there's yeah. play therapy and there's laughter therapy but that's this different is, play right, therapy is, different. is very different right and but, the laughter therapy i think there was a woman out on long island that had initiated some sort of laughter therapy and she had said because mm -hmm. adults have a tendency of not laughing anymore right. children laugh spontaneously right. over nothing right. yep. but um yeah I'm, that's so interesting i'm definitely gonna have to look it up because mm -hmm. it's um it's a wonderful exercise mm -hmm. it's definitely yep. so wonderful I'm gonna look exercise. Up, yeah i'm gonna look up laughter yoga um madan kataria's wife this is embarrassing that I can't remember her name. So that's the other thing is as I'm getting older, mm -hmm. um, I'm noticing um, a change in um, my own mental status, mm -hmm. that there are things that I, that I don't remember that I did before. So for those of us of a certain generation, I call us mm -hmm. seasoned people. Mm -hmm. um, there are a lot of physical and, and um, mental changes that go yes. along with yes. aging. And I'm learning to accept um, that there are some things that, you know, the hard drive is full mm -hmm. and I'm learning to accept that there's some things I'm going to remember like people's names mm -hmm. um, and some things that are, that are going to, I'm going to have to let go by the wayside. Mm -hmm. And if I'm out, you know, out in public with a friend and I see someone approaching me that I know, but I can't remember their name. I'll say to the person I'm with, um, can you please introduce yourself to them first? Mm -hmm. So they'll say their name and I'll remember it. Yes. Um, I don't know if, if you have the same issue, but I walk into a room. I can't remember what I walked in there for. So I have to go no, back happens, to where I was. It yeah. happens to all of us. Yes. Yeah, yeah. I have to go back to where I was and say, oh yeah, that was it. Um, what, I, what I do is um, remind myself of what I need to do. Okay, remember... After this call, you need to, whatever it is I need to do. And otherwise I'll, you know, it'll just slip right out of my brain. Um, do you struggle I'm with a that? No, I'm a note yeah. taker. I'm yep. a note taker. Yep. Mm -hmm. And I do puzzles all the time. And I do matching mm -hmm. all the time to mm -hmm. constantly keep my memory going. But I mm -hmm. am definitely a note taker. And I rewrite the notes and try to 
put things to memory that way. But of course, not like it was years ago. Mm -hmm. Not at all. It happens, you know, to all of us. And, uh, and just trying to, and also trying not to judge. Mm -hmm. Because even though, you know, we're therapists, Mm -hmm. you know, that that's the first thing that goes off is the judging, Mm -hmm. you know, why is it happening? And you, you know, Mm -hmm. you just don't want to beat yourself up about it. Right. 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 Okay. So her name is Midori. I thought that's Midori. Midori. M-A-D-H-U-R-I. Midori. Midori. Um, Wonderful. So that's the other thing. Google has become my brain. Yes. If I can't remember something, if I'm in the middle of a session with someone Mm -hmm. and I'll say, you know, I want you to read this article. Then I say, wait a minute, I'm going to look it up while we're talking. Mm -hmm. And um, it's, you know, it's important as a therapist for me to know stuff. Mm-hmm. to be the resource, to have information. Mm-hmm. But you know, the hard drive has gotten full. Mm-hmm. The Rolodex in my brain has gotten full. Mm-hmm. So I need to rely on other sources. Yes. Um, the other thing that you mentioned just reminded me that as therapists, we need to be compassionate. We need to model self-compassion. Yes. That, you know, I, I like to think that I walk the talk mm-hmm. and I tell my clients, you know, everything I'm suggesting to you, I do it myself. Mm-hmm. I'm the lab setting. Because I'm not going to recommend that you do something that I haven't done or I'm not willing to do. So I see myself as, again, accountability partner, mirror, guide. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, I I have lots of information, but I can't make anybody do anything. Right. I can't make them think anything that they're not inclined to think. Can't get them to Mm -hmm. take action steps unless they are good and ready. Yeah. And there's a, you know, there's... um, a sense of surrender that mm-hmm. goes into yes. that. Yes. Um, yes, absolutely. You know, <laughs> because you can't yeah. force anybody. Can't force yep. anybody to yeah. do anything. Oh, no. Yeah. Nope. And as a, a codependent, people pleasing caregiver who practice savior behavior, wow. I've had to learn what I need to, what I have to surrender with, with mm-hmm. my clients. No, it's not a failure if our clients don't follow our, our sage advice. Mm-hmm. <laughs> no. <clears throat> one exercise that I, that I do daily that I encourage my clients to do and anybody um, takes place in the shower. So turn the water on and I say, I release anger, fear, mm-hmm. anxiety, guilt, shame, blame, anything. You know, and I do it like a little rap song. Mm-hmm. Um, anything um, that caused me or anybody else pain, anything from the past that I can't go back and change. Mm-hmm. And whatever it is I want to let go of, and I say, down the drain. Mm -hmm. Then when I'm soaping up, I'll say, and I call into my life, beauty, magic, wonder, bliss, blessings, abundance, Mm -hmm. prosperity, health. And I notice an interesting shift. The first round, I'm saying it very slowly and like it's dragging me Mm -hmm. down. Second round is like popcorn. Mm -hmm. I don't even have to think about it. And by the time I'm done the shower, I'm clean physically, emotionally, mentally, and spiritually. Yes. So I invite you to try that. Oh, definitely. Um, I'm going to try that. And it's a, it's a good, you know, a good recharger during the day. Yeah. If you're starting to drag, mm-hmm. um, you know, you think, okay, I need a boost here. So instead of an energy drink, do that exercise. You don't mm-hmm. have to be in the shower to do it. Right, do right, it right. You know? Yeah, that's what you can say. I'm letting go of fatigue. I'm letting go yes. of feeling, feeling drained. Yes. Yeah. You know, oh, so- absolutely. Especially. For a therapist, you need to cleanse, right. cleanse and clear yep. as well. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's important to model good self-care. Yes. Um, you know, the, the whole metaphor of um, the oxygen mask, that if you're on a plane and the oxygen mask mm-hmm. comes down, you can't help anybody if you're out. That's right. You're passed out on the floor from oxygen deprivation. So you need to put it on yourself. Yeah. And we forget and it's that. A hard, we? It's a hard lesson to learn. Yeah. Yep. You know, yeah. it's a really a hard yep. lesson to learn. Let to think me help that, you. Right. <laughs> you right. But I mean, to think about it, it that like. you're, fi- you're fussing and fighting to think that, you know, and I, well, I can only talk, speak for myself. And I've thought about that, that example all the time, because then the programming, you're selfish, you're self centered, you're trying to save yourself first. But the reality is, if you don't, help yourself mm-hmm. you cannot help anyone else right and right. it's really almost like a forced lesson to have mm-hmm. to learn for many people right so. yeah and the other metaphor that i use i was a lifeguard when i was in my late teens and early 20s and what they taught us in you know water safety instruction mm-hmm. was that if somebody is flailing and struggling 
don't go after them when they're doing that. It seems counterintuitive, but mm-hmm. what's going to happen if you're in the water with somebody going mm-hmm. like they'll this? They'll drag you down. They'll, they'll drag, drag you down. down. And yeah. then you got two dead people. Yeah. So yeah. you need to let them go under. And sometimes mm-hmm. <clears throat> that happens that we can't always help people fix the boo-boos. Mm-hmm. So we're there to help pick up the pieces if, they, yes. if things fall apart. I think that's that's part of it. Um, I've also learned valuable lessons from other experiences that I've had. In 1981, my, my senior year in college, um, I took an Outward Bound course. Do you know what Outward Bound is? No, a, a, I've heard of it. But... Yeah, it's a wilderness survival course. Mm-hmm. They call it oh, fishing. yes. So here I was, 22 years old. I will never be that young and crazy again. Um, I decided to sign up for a 10 day course in January of 1981 wow. in Maine and New Hampshire. Wow. So I figured if I could, I wanted to move to Vermont after college. Um, and I thought if I could survive outdoors mm-hmm. in the winter in England, <laughs> I could survive indoors. Um, now at the time I was going to school in New Jersey, Glassboro state college, which is now called Rowan university. Mm-hmm. And it was my senior year. And I got, I forget how many extra, like three credits or something to do this. So in that 10 day period, we did cross country skiing, snowshoeing, hiking, backpacking, and camping. Mm-hmm. And for 10 days, we didn't shower and there was no, nowhere to shower, mm-hmm. but also it was so darn cold that the bacteria wouldn't have been able to grow. Mm-hmm. And if it did, we all would have smelled the same anyway. Mm-hmm. Um, so back then my hair was probably about as long as it is now up in a wool hat the whole time. And it almost looked like dreadlocks. So we, oh, wow. <clears throat> when we were done. So um, in that period of time, um, 10 days, I broke my pinky, which is fine now. I had frostbite on both my hands. Oh, wow. Also. I sprained an ankle. Um, I developed bronchitis and I had bruises on my hips from carrying a 50 pound pack, but it was the trip of a lifetime. And I remember something that one of the instructors said to us that I use every day of my life since then. He said, if something isn't going well in your life, the way you want it to do, don't complain, make a positive change. Mm-hmm. He said out here on, on, you know, on the course, mm-hmm. um, if your socks are wet, change your socks. Mm-hmm. Real toes. If you're hot, take off a layer of clothes. Mm-hmm. If you're cold, put on a layer of clothes. If you're hungry, eat. If you're tired, sleep. So when I'm disturbed about something, something bothering me, I'll say, okay, what positive change can you make? Mm -hmm. And it's not spiritual bypass or psychological bypass where you just say, Mm -hmm. oh, just ignore it, it'll go away. I take a look at what it is that's bothering me and saying, all right, is there anything you can do about it? If there is, take that next step. Mm -hmm. If there's nothing you can do about it, how can you learn to live with it? Because that's the reality of adulthood right? Mm-hmm. That we have no control over many aspects of our lives, but mm-hmm. what we can control, we're responsible for controlling. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Right? And, yeah. And I believe there's a solution to everything, mm-hmm. even if it's not the one that's the most that we pleasant. want, right? For us. Right. Yes. Right. Like that sucks. Mm-hmm. Um, my favorite spiritual question is, I, I don't know if you're allowed to say the F word here, but WTF. You know, mm-hmm. like, why is this happening? Mm-hmm. What the, f- you know? Yeah. Um, and sometimes I don't get an answer, mm-hmm. at least not right away. But I also have experienced what I call if not for. So if not for the challenges, if not for the heart attack, something worse could have happened. Mm-hmm. Um, if not for the heart attack, I might not have become, um, I, you know, afterwards I, I started educating women about cardiac symptoms Mm -hmm. and good heart health. So if not for that experience, I wouldn't have been able to do that. Um, If not for the heart attack, I might just have done the the hug mobster stuff casually. There wasn't an urge to do it until the heart attack. Yes. Um, If not for, I don't know, I'm trying to think what else. Um, Just a lot of the things that have happened in my life. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't have, I wouldn't be where I am right now. So I don't believe in blaming the victim. Like you called this into your life or you made it happen or, you know, it's, it happened. It happens. Right. Now what? Now what? What am I going to do about it? Right. How do we deal Um, with it? How do we, 
-hmm. overcome mm -hmm. it? How do we go around it? True. Absolutely. Right. right. Yeah. So a lot of it, that's when I say that I practice what I preach mm -hmm. because I would feel really hypocritical if I didn't do what I suggest that my clients do. Yes. Um, but that's of course, that's, and that's valid. Right. Right. So that's the vulnerability part that we were talking about a little earlier that as therapists initially were taught, Oh, you can't be vulnerable with your clients. Mm -hmm. Gotta be strong. Eh, eh, nope. Um, you know, I disclose what I think would be helpful for them to know. Mm -hmm. um, so they know that I've, you know, that I've been through yes. it. Yes. Um, I was widowed when I was 40. So I could talk to them about Very that. Young, yes. um, yeah. I'm an adoptive parent. I could talk to them about that. Um, I'm an adult orphan. Both of my parents have died. Mm -hmm. I could talk about that. Um, what else? Um, you know, the heart, you know, the health yes. issues. Yes. I can, I, you know, I can explain about that. Codependency. Um, I spent five and a half days in 1993 in an inpatient codependency program because the, you know, the issue of codependency um, is, you know, not knowing where you start and someone else stuff mm -hmm. boundaries. I struggled yes. with boundaries. And my first, after my second day there, one of the women said something that stuck with me. She said, do you realize you're the sickest one here? I said, what do you mean? Wow. She said, you think you have it all together, except your husband and your therapist told you you had to be here. She said, get real woman. You need this as much as we do. Wow. So I'm glad there were still another three and a half days mm -hmm. left of the training. Mm -hmm. I spent another six years going to CODA meetings, Codependence Anonymous. Yes, yes. yes. Um, so I could deal with those issues. And there was a young man there who kept asking me to be his sponsor. Mm -hmm. And I kept telling him, number one, you need a man for your sponsor. Number two, even though I'm a therapist, I'm still, I'm new to recovery. Mm -hmm. And even though it's not a substance, codependence is an insidious addiction. Mm -hmm. You know, the urge to help people, the people pleasing, the, the mm -hmm. savior behavior stuff I mentioned. And, and I said, third of all, my husband is ill. I really don't have the energy to give mm -hmm. to anybody. So for six years, he kept on asking. I kept saying no. Um, the night my husband died, he died, he died of hepatitis C. I was waiting for a liver transplant. Mm -hmm. um, the night he died, I came home and the phone rings and it's this young man. And I said, not only because he kept asking me to talk. And I said, not only can I not be your sponsor, mm -hmm. I can't even talk to you right now. My husband just died. And he said, but, 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 and I said, but I'm hanging up. And that's when we had wall phones and it made mm -hmm. a satisfying click when I hung up. And there was such a sense of exhilaration mm -hmm. in the midst of my grief that I said no to somebody. Yes. And the floor didn't swallow me up and lightning didn't come crashing down. Um, so that's why, you know, it's, that's real. That's genuine. Um, mm -hmm. You know who Brene Brown is, right? Have you ever yes. heard of Brene yes. Brown? My favorite thing about her, she's a social worker also, mm -hmm. is her vulnerability. That she is willing to be real and raw. Mm -hmm. You know, I call it peeling off the layers to reveal the real. Mm -hmm. And I think wounded healers, um, people that have walked through the fire are better at, at their jobs. Mm -hmm. because they can empathize and I'm not talking about transference and counter transference mm -hmm. and all that stuff right. we were talking. Yeah. I'm talking about certainly boundaries, but clients need to know that we're human too. Mm -hmm. Yes, mm -hmm. absolutely. And I would trust a therapist who was human mm -hmm. more than somebody that was more regimented and yes. by the book, mm -hmm. you know, um, so you build, you know, you build trust with your clients, yes. you build trust with your students. Mm -hmm. So I think and that. So that's, where do you think you go from here now? You've done so much. You've given no so much. You've clue. I have no clue. I mean, I thought about it when I did the TEDx talk and people can find it online. It's on YouTube. Yes. Oh, and I'd be going to put everything. Really all well, of the contacts that I want to put, I have the references to your books okay. so that thank they you. can get to that because thank yes. You. And then of course the Ted talk, it's just fantastic. Yeah. Thank you know, you. And what a saw, like, as I said earlier, what a subject, I mean, it's really, mm -hmm. it is yep. almost a taboo. Yep. And, um, yeah. So, uh, you know, once I did all that, I said, all right, you know, I, 
interviewed the Dalai Lama in 2008. I went to Ireland in 2018. I wrote a book in 2010, this set in between. Mm -hmm. um, I did the TEDx talk. I don't, you know, right now, I don't have another bucket list item that feels pressing. So if an idea comes to me, I'll let you know. Um, <laughs> I really don't feel, you know, an, an urge to do something. This is the first time in my life where I'm allowing myself to coast like the bicycle coasting. Yes, yes. I'm not on all the time. The other thing that I do is, is PR and marketing. Um, I'm, I've been working with these filmmakers, um, Vic Comfer and Rodney um, Wittenberg, who created a film called Angels and Saints, Eros and Awe. And it's about the intersection of sexuality and spirituality. Oh, wonderful. Um, it's oh, where, that sounds fascinating. You know, where, we're taught to hang up our sexuality when we go into a religious space and mm -hmm. we're taught to leave religion outside the door when we're involved in a sexual relationship. Mm -hmm. So it's about sexuality, about gender, about wholeness, about overcoming um, religious abuse. Mm -hmm. um, so people want to look that up. It's A-S-E-A, -E which is Angels, Saints, Eros, Awe, A-S-E-A film dot com and they'll learn more about that so i've been working oh, that's wonderful. with these filmmakers to promote the film since it was two years in march and i and i love it i cry every time i see it uh the people that are in the film that are the, the interview subjects um are, are all across or around the gender and sexuality matrix they mm -hmm. don't call it a spectrum it's right. not gay on this end stri you know, right. straight here cisgender transgender you know it's all mishmash together mm -hmm. and most of them are either therapists clergy or sex educators no i um, can't so wait to see it i really can't very powerful very powerful film oh. so the trailer is on the um on the website so people can do that mm -hmm. so the thing is i am never bored um so i'm sure i'll find another oh i'm sure i'm thing. sure i'm sure yeah. you will I'm sure Thank you will you. definitely. Um, I'm just, I, I'm just so thrilled that you had some time to come on and talk mm -hmm. with me, and yes, and have everyone hear all about what you've done, what you're doing. Um, Thank you. It's just absolutely wonderful. Um, I definitely will put everything um, down, all the information for everybody to get to, and the movie itself. So there's just the trailer out, or is the trailer the right? Out? You can go on the website, and there's a way to rent to the part like to, you purchase can purchase rent. Yeah, it to rent. Yeah, yeah um and then we're also looking for communities um seminaries schools um spiritual communities to show the film to you know for them to screen mm -hmm. it and it's won at least a dozen international film festival awards since it came out and it's it's a remarkable film and it's gotten rave reviews from the people that have, have seen it. Mm -hmm. um, one of the coolest ones was some at a conference where we spoke last year, last May, I think, or last October. Um, it was, where was this film when I was 14? Yeah. This film will save souls. This film will save lives. Mm -hmm. And it touches people. Oh, I, I can only imagine. I, I cry can't wait to every see time. It. I've seen it at least a dozen times and I cry every time. And it's got, it's not just talking heads, it's um, people who, I mean, they're songs, mm -hmm. they're, you know, they're written by singer songwriters, including yes. Rodney, who's one of the filmmakers. Um, there's dancing movement. Um, it's absolutely extraordinary. Oh, wonderful. So oh. ASEAfilm.com. Yes. Oh, absolutely. I have to see it. And I hope that uh, you can come on and talk again. Thank anytime, you. Anytime Thank you. you're free. Oh, for, right, right. I'm your friend. Yeah. So um, also, if you have a moment. Check out, yeah. Thank you. If people want to check out my website, it's www.opti, o p t i hyphen mystical, m y s t i c a l dot com. Yes. And um, and I will have that down in video. the notes too. It'll be definitely all down there. Everything there. Thank you. My oh. pleasure. Oh, so I, in thank closing, you. I offer you a great in the audience, a same, great big hug. Same to you. And I thank I thank you for taking the time this evening after you worked all day. I, thank I you. so appreciate it. So now it. I'm going to go rest my voice and drink more tea. <laughs> go right ahead. And hopefully thank we'll you. speak again soon. Thank, thank you so you. much. Thank you.